Okay, let's kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful um, for so many things in our lives. And we're thankful for the hope that we have, for the understanding that we have regarding the events around us. But Lord, we also seek you for greater understanding. We live in perplexing times and we know that we need wisdom and skill in order to uh, give a message of warning to those in this world who do not have hope. And we ask, Lord, that you can help us um, to represent you, that people have a desire to follow you. And we ask that you can be with us in our study now as we continue to look at the book of Ezekiel. May your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts. May you comfort us. We ask for your angels to be around us, to be with our family and friends and those that we come in contact with. And um, we pray for each person studying, whether they're live or whether they're watching these videos later on. We ask that you can be with them. May your Holy Spirit teach us now and bless the reading of your word and the study of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, in this part of the book of Ezekiel, so, so far we, we've covered uh, the first two chapters and a bit of chapter three. And this part is extremely important because it sets up um, the chronology regarding chapter four, which we're going to begin studying next week. And there are, there's a particular issue that we have to address here in Ezekiel, um, which there's a lot of disagreement about. And if, if somebody was going to, to attack um, the chronology that we have regarding uh, the 10th day of the fifth month, um, and how we've set it up in the book of Ezekiel, as you'll see next week. Uh, where they would start is in uh, chapter 3, verse 15. And you'll see what I mean in a minute. <coughs> but before we get into that, I just want to review something regarding this chronology uh, that is important to understand. And <coughs> we know that there's, there's three uh, prophets that prophesy uh, during the Babylonian captivity. Uh, Jeremiah, he begins his prophesying way back in the time of Josiah, and, and particularly in the 13th year, which is 627 B.C., and he prophesies, so he begins prophesying in the time of Josiah, and, and he prophesies all the way uh, to 586, to the end of Zedekiah's reign. So it's, it's quite a long time that he prophesies. I mean, if you, if you look at it here, it could look like 41 years. So it's, you know, it's 40 to 41 years <coughs> that he prophesies. Now we know Daniel... He begins in 627 BC. Now this is the, the third year of Jehoiakim. I'll put it here. And he prophesies for a, a lot longer than anyone else, all the way to 536 BC. So a period of about 71 years. So he's in his 90s at the end of his ministry. And then we have Ezekiel, and Ezekiel begins in 597 BC. And, and he's going to prophesy all the way up to uh, 720 BC, where he has his last vision. Now we know in chapter 40, verse 1, it's in 723 BC uh, that he, he writes his last date, but he actually writes, has a vision that's recorded earlier uh, but it actually occurs later regarding the first day of the first month, and it's a, a prophecy regarding Egypt. So 
And there's a reason why it's placed where it is, because there's all these prophecies about Egypt. Um, so you can see that he's, he's going to be prophesying for a period of about 20, 23 years, um, uh, more than that, 27 years, something to that effect. Um, now, am I doing that right? 20, that'd be 23 years. Yeah, 23 years. Okay. Now, um, when we think about these different prophets, we know that two of them are in exile, in, in a sense. So Daniel's in captivity. And so is Ezekiel. So, you know, he says it's in exile. But, but that just means in captivity. Now, we know Daniel's uh, basically a part of the ruling class. He he's, uh, has a big role in the government. Um, <clears throat> Ezekiel, he's a priest, but obviously as a priest, he doesn't have any uh, duties in, in uh, Babylon. So we're not really sure what he's doing, but he is a prophet. And uh, so we don't know a lot about his everyday life. And then Jeremiah, he, he is not in exile. He's in Jerusalem and okay. dealing with the kings. Um, so he, he doesn't go into exile. He stays in Jerusalem. And then we also, what's that? Theodore? Yeah. Two questions. Okay. Um, first one. No, on, on the board. Yeah. On your your dates of the exile with Ezekiel, you are counting up there where everything else is counting down. Uh, which 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 one? Ezekiel. You're going five ninety seven to seven twenty BC. Yeah. So, oh, part of me. Um, what did I do? Seven twenty three, five ninety seven to twenty seven twenty three. So. Because Ezekiel would have been 597. Yes, I wrote this wrong. I don't know what I was doing there. <laughs> so this would be 570. There we go. That's so better. for a period of 27 years. Yes. Um, is that right? Yeah. Five. No. There, I'm doing it backwards again. It's 470. No, but that doesn't make sense. Hang on. Five. I'm doing something wrong. Five. Yes, it's five seven. Okay, there we go. Okay, so you could. You yes, could, you it's could, five seven. So it's twenty seven years. You're correct. Thank you for correcting that. Okay, so you could you could say that Daniel was Ezekiel's superior in government, but Ezekiel was Daniel's superior in matters of religion because he was a priest, right? Yeah. That's an interesting observation. Okay. And, and how, and whether they had contact with each other, you know, that's the thing is, um, you know, Ezekiel's taken captive 10 years after Daniel. Um, but, you know, we, we don't know particularly whether they knew each other. Um, uh, I would think that they must have at some time or other run into each other uh, just because of uh, Daniel's responsibilities. But, but you know, it could be wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't ever tell us. Um, but thanks for correcting that chronology. I don't know why I did it that way. Uh, my mind was somewhere else. I wasn't really thinking about what I was doing. But anyway. Should, um, yeah. should Ezekiel not be starting in 592? Okay, yeah. So what I'm doing is I'm going from his captivity. So I'm just saying this is the time he's in exile. So yeah, we know that in 592, he actually begins his first vision, right? So in 592 BC, but I was focusing upon the, the fact that he was in exile. So he's in, he's in Babylon from 597 to 570 prophesied. That's, that's was my point. But yes, he begins his, his actual first vision is in 592 BC. So his, his period of visions then is a 22-year period? Um, yes. There's a problem here with 570 and 597. That's not enough time, is it? 70, yeah, is, 80, 90? I guess it is. It's 23. Yeah, I know. It's just I always get mixed up when I look at things backwards, too. Uh, I shouldn't, but I do. Um, yeah, okay. so 
the, the point that I was trying to address was that yeah. if there's a 22 year period for the for that he was prophesying is a symbol that exactly yeah so you know so he's prophesying how do you spell prophesying is 22 years right exactly yeah so that that becomes a symbol okay well, it didn't become a symbol. It is a symbol um, from from uh, Joseph's first uh, his two visions until their fulfillment is twenty two years. Now, the reason that I bring this up um, is, you know, one of the things about Ezekiel that is he's in captivity, just like Daniel is, and Jeremiah isn't. And and I bring this up from a chronological point of view because some people argue that um, Jeremiah's chronology is different than Ezekiel's because Jeremiah is in Jerusalem and he has access to the Jewish calendar and Ezekiel doesn't because um, he's in Babylon. He doesn't have access to what's happening in the sky in Jerusalem and, um, and the determinations of, of the beginning of the year and so forth. And in the book of Ezekiel, uh, I do use the Babylonian calendar. That is when I believe that when he's giving dates, he's using the calendar from Babylon and that he's following their rules regarding the calendar as far as when he gives his dates. And, and Ezekiel gives 13 dates in his book. And I take the position that when he has is, is giving a date, he's dating a vision, um, that that vision occurs on that date, uh, that he's not talking about... Um, a period of time or, or some people would just take it well he just dates some of his visions so he has a vision and he gives a date but then he has a bunch of other visions afterwards and they could be any time um when we look at john the revelator he's also in exile so we got john in exile and he's on the isle of patmos and and, and john in his visions I, I don't know specifically the years we usually put you know, 97 AD is when, around then is when the book of Revelation was written. Um, but obviously this is, you know, that's the time in which, and he has this one vision on the Lord's day, which is on a Sabbath. And we know that Ezekiel's first vision on July 21st, 592 BC. Um, so if you put this in July 21st, is on a Sabbath. And, and same with the John, it's on a Sabbath that he has his vision. And Ezekiel's first vision on, is on a Sabbath. And, and a few of his other visions are also on Sabbaths. Um, now, the interesting thing about these ones that are in ex exile is they all write uh, what we call apocalyptic uh, prophecy. That is, their, their prophecies are highly symbolic. Uh, Jeremiah is, is more a narrative of his interaction, and of course he does have prophecies that he writes out, but they're not as symbolic. They, they're not using that apocalyptic uh, language that you see with John, Daniel, and Ezekiel. So they share something in the characteristics of their prophecy, but also in the situation that they exist in. Now, some people have argued the reason why you know, John writes in this apocalyptic style is because he's in captive to the Romans and he's giving all these things that if he wrote them in a plain language, the Romans would uh, censure his, his letter that he's sending out. Um, I'm not so sure that that's the reason, uh, but there is something about the fact that they're all in captivity or exile and they're writing apocalyptic literature. And, and they're writing, and, and part of the reason why they do that is the prophet is, is illustrating by his life, he's illustrating to the people that he's writing to. That is, he's writing to people who, in a sense, are in a captivity. Um, and, and the situations of his life, the situations that he's in, uh, especially in Ezekiel, you can see he acts out all these different uh, visions or, or parables. And even John 
Uh, he doesn't act them out, but he's in certain locations. And down there, you can see too, at time he's in certain locations in vision when he's not there in reality. Um, and this isn't well understood. It's not something that when you read uh, commentaries on Daniel and Revelation, that people really pick up on, uh, that this prophet uh, goes to these places in vision, and he's not, not necessarily there in person. And, and we're going to see this with Ezekiel chapter 3, uh, that there's some things that are happening. And, and sometimes in, an, in Ezekiel, because he's having all these visions, uh, and he'll have these visions all in one day. So he gives a date when he had these visions. And then things happen in these visions. And some people think that they're happening in reality. But uh, the point that I make is that they're not. Um, and, and we can see this in when we get later on. And so we're going to have to look at that because we're going to address this in chapter three. Let's one, one, one last question before yeah. you go on. Yep, yeah, good. On the captivity of Daniel, third year of Jehoiakim, are yeah. you are you dating that now twenty years later than what had normally been dated? Uh, I mean, the I'm, third year of Jehoiakim for Daniel's captivity. Yeah, six oh seven. Okay, did I write six twenty seven? Yes, <laughs> and that would have been twenty years earlier. Thank you. Another correction. Okay, so in 607, and I was thinking at the time that, you know, he's writing uh, 20 years after uh, um, Jeremiah begins his prophecy. And so I was thinking about Jeremiah, and that's why I wrote 627. So it's 20 years later. And um, yeah, in the third year of Jehoiakim, it's in the fall, which I've established uh, based on a number of different uh, uh, verses in the Bible that we can actually date it pretty precisely to be the fall of 607 because the third year of Jehoiakim goes from the fall of 607 to the fall of 606 and since it most of it nine months out of the year of are in the year 606 so Jehoiakim uh, his third year nine of those months are in the year 606 most people just date Daniel's captivity to 606 this is the way the pioneers did it they didn't have the tools to refine it where within the third year of Jehoiakim he was taken captive. Um, so we put it into the, into the fall. And, and there's a reason why, which I'm not going to go into in this study. But anyway, uh, so Daniel, of course, is prophesying uh, through this long period of time while he's in Babylon. So in Ezekiel chapter 3, um, we're going to start at verse 12. And it says, then the spirit took me up and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, blessed be the glory of Lord of the Lord from his place. And I heard also the noise of wings and of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and a noise of a great rushing. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away. And I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. And then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Abib, uh, that dwelt by the river of Kibar. And I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. And so we see here that Ezekiel is going to be taken up in spirit in this vision uh, with these angels. So these living creatures, he's going to be traveling with them. Right? We, we can hear this. There's this. Uh, the wind that is in these wheels, uh, this same wind, the same spirit, is going to lift him up. And, and it's going to take him away. Now, what some people think, and what most people think, is that he actually goes to this location in, in reality. Um, now, some commentators uh, caution this, and they, they deal with that because of the language. Uh, but also the nature of what happens that he's going to sit there uh, astonished means uh, dumb and still. So that means he's not actually moving uh, for seven days. Now, of course, that is possible. Uh, as a prophet, he could be in some kind of a trance for seven days. But it'd be pretty difficult for a person to just sit there for seven days. 
Um, but there are some symbolisms that are here. And so I take the position that this all occurs in vision. And you'll, you'll see why in a minute as we go through uh, the, the evidences for this. But this came up in a, uh, a presentation that Jeff was doing um, addressing uh, this chapter. And he took the position that these seven days were actually literal days. Um, so, so we have this difference of opinion. This was way back in 2018 uh, that this happened. And, and I think it was actually in the presentation that Jeff was doing just after he had gotten back, I'm not certain, but it might've been just before he went um, uh, to uh, Brazil. But uh, I, I can't remember if it was just before or just after. But anyway, the point was there was this difference of, of views regarding this. Now, my July 18th prediction, as you'll see next week, is based upon the idea that Ezekiel begins to lie on his left side on July 21st. So if there was actually seven days passing, that would definitely affect uh, the count of those uh, of, of the time that he lay on his left side. So it's an important point. Um, so it's something that I actually addressed in November of, of uh, 2018. And I addressed it um, based upon, uh, no, my phone's ringing, I can't answer it. So anyway, uh, I, I addressed it based upon, uh, I was studying it, what Jeff had mentioned and I was, I was doing my presentation on Ezekiel's wheels within wheels. So it was in that presentation uh, that I addressed it. So that's a sermon that I did at Lambert Church. So, so it, it was something that I addressed way back then. And I actually did a study on it. Um, I was trying to look for my notes on it. But it, it's pretty simple to do uh, from the scriptures. So... One of the things we have uh, to reference us is other places where very, the same language is used. So we're going to look at those verses. Uh, chapter 8, um, chapter 8, verse 3. So the same language is going to be used. Um, but in this one, in chapter 8, which we're going to study in detail, obviously, when we get there. But it says, and he put forth the form of an hand and took me by the lock of mine head. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in visions, in the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And, um, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there according to the vision that I saw in the plain. So he's actually going to even go back to uh, the original vision that he saw of the cherubim on the plain. And, and there's this, the glory of the God of Israel was there. Um, the word glory is kabod. Uh, and it's, it's also, we know it in the word ichabod, which means glory has departed. Um, so that, that, that's the word that's glory there. Um, and there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff that happens when we look at it. We know that Ezekiel was not brought to Jerusalem. And, and we'll see that clearly when we get to chapter 8, uh, that he's actually looking into man's hearts by looking at a hole in the wall of the temple. He's not seeing something that's actually occurring. He's seeing something that's uh, symbolic or representative. Um, and then in chapter 11, um, we have the same thing in verse one, I believe. Yes. And moreover, the spirit lifted me up and brought me unto the east gate of the Lord's house, which looketh eastward and behold the door of the gate, five and 20 men whom I saw. So he's going to have this other vision. And in this vision, he's again going to be lifted up and he's brought to uh, the east gate of the temple. Now we know that he's in Babylon, so he's, he's not there literally. And then the other one's also in this um, chapter, uh, I believe. Uh, I need to go back. Um, yeah, 
it would have been 1124. So let's go back there. Oops. Yeah, there it is. So in, in 1124, it says, and afterwards the spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. So the vision that I'd seen went up from me. So again, he's going to speak to them in the captivity. And then I spake unto them of the captivity, all the things that the Lord had shown me. So, and, and it's not even clear here, is he speaking to them of the captivity in vision in this, in verse 25? But we know that he is brought in vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea to them of the captivity. Now he's there in Babylon or Chaldea. So uh, just by these verses alone, we can see that he's, he's having these visions and, and things are going to happen in these visions. And, and sometimes it's not clear what's in the vision and what happens after the vision. Now, um, one of the commentaries, which is uh, one that I use quite a bit, it's, um, it's over here. I'll just bring my commentary. Uh, this is Akil and Dilich, however you say their names. Um, and they, they talk about this. Now, they write in a very technical, they're writing for not the common person. Uh, they're writing for the scholar. Um, and they wrote a long time ago. Um, so they, they talk about this. Now, uh, where is this here? Okay, so it's in this section. So he uses some Latin and, and different things too. Um, Uh, this representation that he was born thither through the air by the wind. Um, and he mentions uh, one of the scholars, Clayforth, but not as Jerome and Clayforth suppose in ipso corpore, uh, that is so that an actual bodily removal through the air took place, but the raising up and taking away by the wind was affected in spirit and in condition of ecstasy, which just means he's in vision, not a syllable, indicates that the theophany was at an end before this removal. The contrary, rather, is clearly indicated by the remark that Ezekiel heard behind him the noise of the wings of the cherubim and of the wheels, and that the words um, ruach uh, kashanai, which is uh, basically, um, I was lifted up by the spirit. He's actually putting him in the different order than in the Hebrew, but uh, do not necessitate us to suppose a bodily removal is shown by the comparison with the verses that I just showed you, Ezekiel 8.3, Ezekiel 11.1, 1, and Ezekiel 11.24, um, where Cliforth also understands the same words in a spiritual sense of merely internal. So he's saying that Cliforth takes those passages as internal, but he takes uh, this first one as not. Uh, but he says that they're the same words, and it doesn't make sense to... Uh, to take them in one sense that he's actually uh, bodily removed to a place and another one he just occurs in vision. Now, the great noise which Ezekiel hears behind him proceeds at least in part from the appearance of the kabod, the glory, being set in motion. But according to Ezekiel 3.13, not in order to remove itself from the raptured prophet, but by changing its present position to attend the prophet to the sphere of his labor. So in vision, these cherubim are escorting him to the scene of his labor. This is the labor that he's going to be doing. He's going to be laboring uh, for the children of Israel. So this becomes extremely important in, in this context. So here is how I understand this. Um, And, and, and I want discussion on this because, you know, there's kind of, I mean, this is an important point. So we know that Ezekiel is going to begin his prophesying in 592 BC. And he references us to 622 BC. Um, 
as being a period of 30 years. And we know that Ezekiel is a priest. Right, he tells us that in chapter 1, verse 1. And, and he mentions this 30 years. Now, this 30 years goes back to the Passover of Josiah. And uh, this Passover, obviously, is, is a work that normally the priests are involved in. So there's a, a work going on with priests over here. But, of course, Ezekiel isn't involved in that. Now, we know Ezekiel is a priest. We assume also that when he talks about this 30 years, it's a symbol of the age that a priest needs to become in order to be a priest. So, so there's, there's a symbolism here, and we know that we've applied this symbolism uh, from 1989 to 91 to 2019 to 2021. So these are periods of 777 days. And, and they're connected by 30 years. Now, Ezekiel then is this priest, so he's got these 30 years that he needs. And when a priest becomes a priest, there's a period of consecration. Uh, does anybody know how long this period of consecration is? that the priest undergoes. Is it seven days? Okay, well, it's seven days. <laughs> I, I need the verse, and I, I should have looked it up, and I didn't. I mean, I did look it up, but I don't remember what it is. Oops, I'm typing in the wrong computer. So, we go here, seven days. And it's going to be, there's lots of periods of seven days. And I believe it's in Leviticus, but could have looked up the word consecration. Uh, so it's in Leviticus 8, um, 8.33. So I think this is the one. Um, so this is going to be Moses and Aaron. So this is the consecration of Aaron. And ye shall go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be at an end. For seven days shall he consecrate you. So there's this period of conse consecration, which is seven days. Um, now it says here, uh, this is the commentary, Akil and Diligence. The consecration was to last seven days, during which time the persons to be consecrated were not to go away from the door of the tabernacle, but to remain there day and night and watch the watch of the Lord that they might not die. For the Lord will fill your hand seven days as they have done on this, the first day. So has Jehovah commanded to do to make atonement for you. That is to say, the rite of consecration, which has been performed upon you today, Jehovah is commanded to be performed and repeated for seven days. Uh, these words clear, clearly imply that the whole ceremony and all its details was repeated for seven days and, and so forth. So we have this, this consecration, uh, which applies at least to the priests and, and Aaron here, but also to others, um, is seven days. So when I look then at, yeah, and, and you didn't see that on the screen, so if you, um, I, can sh I can give you that reference is obviously uh, uh, Leviticus 8.33. So... If you look there and you look at Kiel and Delich's commentary on, on that passage from 833 to 836. So we're going to say here that there's symbolically a period of seven days of consecration if I spelled that right um, that happens in 592 BC but it's, it's not in reality. That is, it occurs in vision. This is, this is my point, that this is, he's going to be set up as a watchman, as we will see. And in order to do that, he's got to be 30 years old, and then he's going to have these seven days of consecration. And, and since he can't, um, you know, obviously he can't go to the temple, but in this one, in vision, he goes and sits among these elders of Israel 
in vision in order to have this consecration. Now, the fact that the cherubim are the ones carrying him to Tel Aviv, and, and there's also disagreements about where Tel Aviv is. Um, so if you, if you look on a map of the Levant here, where you have Israel, um, and then you got Syria, and then you have uh, Assyria and Babylon, some people put Tel Aviv up here, and some put it further down south. Uh, in Babylon itself, rather than up in the area that would have been Assyria. So, so it's not the Tel Aviv that uh, is the capital of, of Israel. I don't know, is Tel Aviv the capital? I think it's sort of the, uh, the political capital, anyway, of Israel. Um, so that's, you know, the main city in Israel is Tel Aviv. That's the same word in Hebrew, Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv, same thing. So but the point is, I mean, he's obviously not taken here. He's taken into where the people of the captivity are. And, and then he's going to sit there for seven days in, in vision. Um, so, um, so just looking at this a little bit too, when the spirit lifted him up, so we know that um, the spirit took him up and he heard behind him a voice of a great rushing. And we can see that these noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and the noise of the great rushing, he heard this. And so the spirit lifted me up. So this is the spirit or the wind that is that moved the wheels. So he's being taken up by these cherubim. And then it says, it came to, the, to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Kibar, and I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. So I would think that this, this Tel Aviv is in northern Babylon uh, by the river of Kibar, which is, is a branch of the Euphrates River. Um, now it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, so this would be the one where just somebody reading this out of context would just think, there's a period of an end of seven days and the word of the Lord came on, comes unto him so that he's actually literally brought there and he's seven days sitting there and then God comes to him again. But I take the position that this is in vision based upon the context. And then he says, son of man, I've made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. So we know that he's a priest and we know that he has this period of consecration but they're in captivity and his message is going to be to the people in captivity. Uh, his message is not to the people in Jerusalem. Jeremiah is prophesying, prophesying to those in Jerusalem. Daniel, uh, he doesn't actually write out his visions until near the end of his life. So even though he has all these visions, the book of Daniel isn't written as he goes. It's written at the end. And we can tell that by some of the language and how he, he's referring to things in the past um, in a, uh, uh, a way that you know that he's referring to something in the past, um, not something that's happening then. So, uh, so Daniel doesn't really have a message to the people during that time, but at the end, he collects all these things that have happened and writes the book of Daniel. And that book of Daniel is for those who are going back to Jerusalem. So this is a message about the end of that captivity. That's primarily what he's focused upon. But Ezekiel is writing contemporaneously. So he's writing out these prophecies and people know he's a prophet and um, they're going to see these things happen in action. And then we also have, um, uh, you know, Jeremiah, he's in Jerusalem. He's prophesying to the people in Jerusalem and he's interacting with them there. Uh, with Daniel, we don't see him interacting as a prophet in his book, like we do with Ezekiel or Jeremiah. Uh, so any thoughts on this before we get into the watchman? Uh, does anybody have any questions about my argument? Um, you know, because I've thought about it a lot, and I know that maybe you haven't, but maybe you've seen something that, that I haven't seen. Okay, for, for Ezekiel to be a priest in 592, wouldn't he already have gone through the consecration and be, had been more than 30 years old at that time? 
Okay, so that's a good question. Um, when somebody's a priest, they're born to be a priest. And, and the way that I'm taking it here is that he's, he's a priest, whether he's had consecration or not before. I believe that there's symbolism here. So whether we, we literally know how old Ezekiel is, we don't. Um, but if at 30 years of, old, year, years of age, he's a priest, and he's been in captivity for five years, right? So he was taken captive in 597. And if he's 30, he was taken captive when he was 25. And, um, but he is a priest. And, and it could be that God is just taking him at 30 years of age and now consecrating him for this work as a prophet. But he's a prophet who is a priest, where many of the other prophets aren't priests. And so there's a symbolism there. And, 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 that's, and that's the important part of it, whether we, we know literally whether he's 30 years of age or not. As far as the symbolism is concerned, the 30 years symbolizes the priest, as do the seven days of consecration. And, and I would argue that, you know, it's the symbolism that matters in, in this context, because we just don't know. We, we can't prove it one way or another how old he is. Because he is told to prophesy, the people of his time get the message, and as, as do we. Right. Now, another detail, um, which, which I, I, I sort of mentioned, but I just want to emphasize in that. So if you're going to compare him with our history, we know that there is this period of time from when our movement is born until this period of time we become a priest. And... And it's at the end of that 30 years that these cherubim, which are representative of the zodiac or of the sky, that are addressing time prophecy, that they're consecrating him, that is, they're carrying him to give a message to the people of the captivity. And this period of seven days, to me, lines up with this period of 777 days as a period of consecration. And so when we look at uh, 1989 to 1991, we know there's this 777 days, and then we get to this 777 days here. And my argument is that from November 9th to December 21st, now remember, we're not time setting, we're not, we're not marking any event in, in, in history or, or external event, with December 25th, 2021. We just have the symbol here that on November 9th, 1989, the wall came down. And then on December 25th, 1991, the Soviet Union ends. And so we have that same period of 777 days here, going from November 9th to December 25th, 2021. And of course, we know this is a symbol right? The 777 days is a symbol. And it's a symbol of consecration, but it's, it's threefold. So there's a three-step testing prophetic message. And so during this period of time, uh, the priests are experiencing that seven days that Ezekiel experiences. It's a, a period of consecration as a priest. So we just looked at the beginning. We said November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019. That's 30 years. And so now we're priests. But we actually have a period of consecration. And this is symbolized by these periods of 777 days that are matched at the beginning. They don't necessarily need to mark external events. They just are a symbol, on the, on at least on that level, of this consecration, of this movement to give a message, right? So this movement has to give a message to the people of the captivity. And we know that the call is to call people out of Babylon, but we still have to give a message before we can even call them out of Babylon. That is, uh, we know that Babylon is going to be bringing on a Sunday law, but we have to be able to uh, give them a message to, for them to go through an experience so that when that Sunday law comes, they will be able to pass that test. And that's, that I believe is the role of this ministry, but it's that cherubim or these, these representations of the Zodiac, they're angels, but they're representing the Zodiac. They're representing the chronology of God. 
and, and, and that's part of what consecrates them to give this message. That's the way I look at it. Uh, that, that's how I put together these pieces. Does that make sense or not make sense? Or does anyone have questions or comments on that? Sounds like a lot of people are in captivity. Well, yeah, but we would have to say that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in captivity in Babylon. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is not Babylon, right? Because as a symbol, Babylon can't refer to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in captivity. And, and there of, is a... Some of them know, know it, some of them don't. It's evident that uh, they're in Babylon uh, symbolically. Yes, but they're, they're not Babylon, right? The Seventh-day Adventist Correct. Church is not Babylon. Correct. The Jews, when they go into exile in Babylon, they don't become Babylon. No, but they're, they're there. symbolically there. Right, and they, they still need to be called out of Babylon, right? That's what happened to the Jews. The Jews were not Babylon when they were in Babylonian captivity. They were in Babylon, and they had to be called out of Babylon, right? They exactly. had to leave that captivity. And, and this point, for some reason escapes most Adventists. Because when you talk about a call to come out of Babylon, they'll say the Seventh-day Adventist Church is not Babylon. But what they don't recognize is that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in captivity in Babylon. And, and the way that we, we know that, the way that we get out of that captivity is to heed the call. And we're called out before the Sunday law. We have to be called out of Babylon because we can't receive of that mark. So there's gonna be a test are we going to stay in Babylon and receive the mark? Or are we going to come out of Babylon and receive the seal of God? So, so I hope this makes sense to people. I mean, it makes sense to me. But just because something makes sense to me doesn't mean it makes sense to other people. Um, this idea of, of what the, the role of the cherubim are. Yes, Stephen, you have a comment? I was going to speak about what you were saying about Daniel. Yeah. That he writes, he writes his book at the end of his life. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ezekiel mentions him along with Noah and Job. So, yes. And he's going well, to speak out to... They know about Daniel. And, and they know yes. about his, his, his um, character. Right? Because that's, that's... So whether Ezekiel actually met Daniel or Daniel's just really well known in Babylon for his character. Um, that, that's the question. So when Ezekiel's writing... Uh, he definitely knows about Daniel. And, and Daniel is, is somebody who, and, and you could think about it from this perspective. If you're a Jew and, and you've gone to, you, you're in captivity in Bab Babylon now, and you see another Jew who's basically famous, right? And he has, you know, interpreted, you know, even though he's not written this out and it's not like a letter going around, but you know the story. You know why he is, um, in the position that he is in Babylon, that he, he was one of those uh, captives of the children of the captives who was 10 times wiser than all the wise men, um, that he interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so there would be a fame there that every Jew who's in captivity is going to know about Daniel. That's the way that I would look at it. Uh, but definitely he's not uh, publishing his visions as he's going along. He's not addressing of the people in the visions. They're not written to anybody. Um, it's a story that he writes after the fact. Um, and you can tell by the, the narration that he's referring to events in the past and in the distant past, uh, because he refers to, especially like at the beginning of chapter one, he talks about King Nebuchadnezzar. Well, Nebuchadnezzar isn't king when Daniel's taken captive. He's made king. So you know at least it was written after uh, Nebuchadnezzar was king, but you don't call him Prince Nebuchadnezzar because he's been the king of Babylon and he died long before. So, but but a good point uh, to bring up. Um, any other thoughts? Okay, so for Ezekiel to be a priest, he was also of the tribe of Levi, correct? Uh, Yes, of course, yeah, to be a, a priest, you have to be of the tribe of Levi. Uh, you would actually have to be a son of, a son of Zadok. 
um, because um, at least I'm, I'm not sure if it, which time it was, but the sons of Zadok became the priests. And actually, when you talk about the Sadducees, the Sadducees are priests. Uh, Sadducees is just a, a Greek form of Zadok. It means that you're of the sons of Zadok. Um, so yeah, so to be a priest, uh, you're a son of Levi, but you're also a son of Zadok. Um, so there's this descendant line, which becomes the priests. Okay, but not all Levites were priests. No, nope, not all Levites are priests, but all priests are Levites. So what, what you're saying is here we have, of course, Daniel being of the, the ruling family. So he was of the tribe of Judah. And mm -hmm. Ezekiel was of the tribe of Levi but was a priest of the tribe of Levi. Right. Yeah. And, and just to, to emphasize that point there, um, not everybody may have thought about it, but Daniel, the reason he was brought and trained in Babylon, uh, that the, the Nebuchadnezzar and, and the Babylonian kings would take people from the ruling class and, and train them and give them uh, positions in government, uh, sometimes in the land uh, that they're taken from, uh, most of the times in the land that they're taken from. And that's what Daniel would have been trained for, but he ended up staying in Babylon. Um, so he would have been of the tribe of Judah in order for them to do that. And now we could say, well, maybe they would just take any old person, but really when they would look at it, they would just see that somebody of the tribe of Judah would have uh, the royal blood and they would have the respect of the people if you put somebody else from some other tribe as, as it, somebody who's a ruler, that, that person wouldn't be respected. At least that's, that's the sort of the, the, the rationale that's been used. But, but you're bringing up a good point. So you've got uh, one from Levi, who's also a priest, and then you have one from the tribe, tribe of Judah. They're both in exile and they're both prophets. So, so we can see how this, 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 this first part of Ezekiel, how important it is uh, to set up the message that Ezekiel is going to give. Now, um, we know that he goes through this period of dedication or consecration, and then he's given a message. Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Uh, therefore, hear the word of the Lord at my mouth. I just got to get this shared here. <clears throat> and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. And yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not away from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So one of the things that we experienced in this movement is we had to give a warning. And we believed, based on the evidence, based upon the chronology, uh, that, and based upon Ellen White's vision regarding Nashville, that an attack of a nuclear nature was going to occur in Nashville on July 18th. And we felt that it was our responsibility to give that warning based on Ezekiel chapter three and other passages. Um, and, and so we gave that warning. Now, some people have said that we need to repent of that because it didn't occur, but we would look to examples like Job, or not Job, uh, Jonah. So when Jonah gave his warning of uh, the people repented and the city of Nineveh wasn't destroyed, and, and Jonah, of course, was upset about that uh, because he's then going to be considered a false prophet. But if we look at the context of, of this, this message that we have to give in, in this whole context and about these, this period of time, we know that we have to be consecrated to give this message. And, and my argument has been that we weren't consecrated. We believe that we were priests because we looked at the 30 years, but we didn't realize that we had to uh, have this test, this seven days. And, and I believe that this seven days is this period of time that we're in right now. 
This is the period of consecration to give this message. But, you know, we ran before we, we were supposed to, but that was part of our experience or our consecration or our test. Were we willing to give that message? And, and, if we, and when we failed with, with that message, it didn't work out the way we expected. Are we going to continue with that message, knowing that God was leading um, and that it was the cherubim that carried us? And, and I believe that it is. I believe that it's the chronology of the Bible. It's God's time clock that has guided us in our, in our message. And we can't ignore that. And we, we've seen so much evidence for it. But somebody would argue that you were just wrong. And since you were wrong, you need to set aside your pride and just admit you were wrong and that you have to go back to where you went off the path. And, and yet we can't, we, one issue, we can't say we were wrong any more than the Millerites could say that they were wrong about October 22nd. They can say they were wrong about the event, but not about the time. And so we believe that we are correct as regarding the time, we just made a wrong application. It's still about the message that Nashville is gonna receive destruction and other cities are going to, to receive destruction. And, and about Islam and about Rafi and Paniam, that's still part of our message. It's just that we thought that these dates were going to give us the timing of those events and they only did so in a typical way. So we went through an experience, which I would call Samuel Snow's letters or parallel Samuel Snow's letters, which is about a prediction before midnight. So, so we've covered that. Um, so it says in verse 20, uh, and again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So this is talking about a righteous man. This is not talking about somebody who's a sinner, but somebody who is, is righteous, and then he turns away, he commits iniquity, and, and God lays a stumbling block before him. If that, and, and I would look at that stumbling block as like a test. But we have to warn him, and if we don't warn him, God will require his blood in our hand. So we have this responsibility to give a message to a righteous man, which I would think would be the Levites. It would be the Seventh-day Adventist church. Never nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also thou hast delivered thy soul. So, so this is a message to people who are, are sinners, are in their iniquity, um, and, and a message to a righteous man. So I would say the ones that are in iniquity is the message of warning to the world and to those in apostasy. But the righteous man is to the Levites, the ones who um, know the truth. We could say uh, conservative Adventists if we wanted to use that term, but those that are seeking the truth. But the thing is, there's a, there's a test for them. And so God is saying that we need to warn them. And so we have this responsibility to the sinner and to the saint um, in that sense that we have to warn them to the church and to the world if we wanted even to look at it that way. Uh, to those that we that are appearing to follow God and those that aren't. So we have to warn all of them. And we know with Nashville, we weren't just warning Seventh-day Adventists. We were warning the people of Nashville. And people have taken up that warning, even though the event didn't occur when we expected. People are now noting this. I, I watched a video yesterday, a part of it, of an Adventist, some kind of minister. I don't know who he is. He didn't say on the video. Um, but he had just recently been impressed with Ellen White's vision regarding Nashville. And he did a study on it. I didn't watch the whole thing. It was quite long, but I watched portions of it. And so um, he thinks that we have to give this warning uh, to Nashville. He doesn't realize that it's already been given, at least from what I could see in the video. He doesn't seem to know anything about our warning. Um, and then in verse uh, 22, uh, if we don't have any comments, anybody have comments on this giving of this warning? Uh, us being a watchman.
Well, my understanding is that we're a watchman to the house of Israel. Yes. So rather than giving it, saying the sinners are in the world, would it not be more logical to say that it's the sinners in Zion? Well, yes. And, that, and that's what I'm saying. The primary application is to those that in the church, that's the primary application. Those that are, are in apostasy in the church and those that appear to be doing righteous. That's who this primarily is to. Because this is a message to the house of Israel. I'm just saying that we can make an application that's broader than that. Because we did. We did with Nashville. But I would agree that, that we are a, a watchman to the house of Israel. That's, that's our primary role or responsibility. So we're still not um, giving our primary message to the world. We're, we're giving our message to the Seventh-day Adventist church, to the Levites. That's, that's the role that we've been given. But in that, we have, have made uh, uh, a warning to the people of Nashville, not just to Seventh-day Adventists in Nashville. But so, yeah, thanks for clarifying that point there. During this process, uh, each of us as individuals went out and stuck our neck out on that block, uh, probably more so than many outside of the, uh, the movement's uh, warning. Mm -hmm. And that part of being a watchman is, I think, what drove me. Yeah, it's something that we have to take seriously. Um, so uh, let's look at verse 22. And the hand of the Lord was there upon me. And he said unto me, Arise, go forth into the plain, and I will there talk with thee. Then I arose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there, as the glory which I saw by the river of Kibar, and I fell on my face. Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me, Go shut thyself within thine house. So this is part of the, the, this study of chapter 3 that I'm not sure that I, I know how to apply it. So I definitely want some, some suggestions here. But thou, O son of man, behold, they, they shall put bands upon thee and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. So I don't know if this is referring to chapter 4, where he's going to be um, bound uh, when we get to that next week. I don't know if that's what that's referring to, or if this is referring to some kind of imprisonment um, uh, that's, that's happening. So he's going to shut himself in his house, um, but they're going to put bands on thee and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and shalt not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear, for they are a rebellious house. Yeah, so Angela says it sounds like house arrest, a tearing time, like the pandemic or scandemic, as she calls it, lockdown. So <laughs> whether this is referring to the pandemic or not, I, I don't know. Um, but, but there's part of this that we're going to see later as we go through Ezekiel. We know that um, he's going to make a prophecy that's going to apply to the start of the siege based on 390 years and 40 years. And, and then when that happens, his wife is going to die. And then he's also going to be made dumb. Uh, and then he's going to stay dumb until somebody comes from the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I'm not sure what this means. So in what context we put this, because we just had this warning message, right? So he's, he's told that he's a watchman to the house of Israel. And that he has to give this warning. He has to give it to the, the person who's in apostasy, who's a sinner, and also to those that are, are in the church, right? Because in this context, when you deal with Jerusalem, I mean, you got, or, or you deal with Israel, I mean, that's just somebody who's a descendant of Israel. So we know that we have Adventists who aren't really Christians at all. They don't live an Adventist life. And our, our message is to them, not just to those in the church that are still attending. Uh, but anyway, uh, so he has this message of warning as a watchman. 
So now he, and he's been told that he has to warn these different groups of people. And then he says, arise, go forth into the plain and there, and I will there talk with thee. So he's going to see the glory of the Lord, uh, just like he saw by the river of Kibar. So he's going to see the same message uh, that he saw earlier, which we say is chronology. It's, it's God's time clock. That's what he's going to see. That's the glory of the Lord. It's that same vision. It doesn't describe it here, but it's basically what he saw before is what he's seeing now. What he saw by the river of Kibar in chapter, uh, chapter 1, where he now is, is seen here in the plain. So I'm not sure what that means, being in the plain, and why this difference. And then the Spirit is going to enter him, right? So, and this time it's going to set him upon his feet. And then God's going to speak to him and tells him to shut himself in his house. And I'm not sure what that means. Any, any thoughts on that besides the scandemic? Um, any thoughts of what this could mean? You know, it sounds like a type of house arrest, but we, we don't know much about it. Uh, it's just something that's told to him. He's not going to be able to go out among the people and uh, prophesy or speak with them or try to change their minds anymore until uh, the tongue has been removed from the top of his mouth. Um, okay, well, another way we, well, if we don't go to the next verse and that they shall bind me and just try to look at shut thyself within, the, within thine house. Normally this is in the context of, um, and I was just looking at the notes here and thinking about this, uh, of the commentary. Um, now, this, this, uh, this commentary is Albert Barnes. Uh, Shut in the privacy of his own chamber, he is to receive a message from Yahweh. So I think a little bit about the, um, the upper room. When the disciples, after their disappointment, they went and shut themselves in the upper room. And, and, and so I see this kind of as a parallel to that. Um, and they were supposed to wait in the upper room until, you know, God gave them this message. And so yeah, you don't have everyone going to their own house here. You've just got one man going to his house. Right. It's now, not a he, pandemic. It's, what, it's something God right. is doing with this. With his, with his, this movement, right? Because Ezekiel is one man, but he represents Samuel Snow, and he represents us. So Snow and Ezekiel are types. Yeah, applying of, it to us, us we're, we're going to be silenced for a, a while. Right. And, and, and we could say that that in some way has happened. Um, but right now, the, the, and, and this parallels with what I've been saying that our, our responsibility is and what we're doing right now in studying Ezekiel is uh, the movement, in a sense, is in disarray. So we know just that count the people in this room. And, and we're, we're, we're silenced as far as um, from amongst ourselves. Yeah, yeah. But the, but the movement's in disarray, and, and my view is that we need to study, and, and we need to pray, right? We need to know what God is asking us to do. And, you know, and some people have said, why isn't Jeff speaking? Um, you know, why has he not done any presentation since July 18th? Well, I would say that he's probably following this counsel, is that he's waiting until he hears a word from God of what to say, um, Right, because God is gonna, it with this movement. Um, if we just take this as this movement, we know that we have to study. But when God speaks with us, then we have to open our mouth. Right, that's in in verse twenty seven. Whether they hear, or whether they forbear, and I still think that even though we gave this message a warning, and God has, I believe, empowered this movement, but He's empowered this movement in a way that we don't expect or we didn't expect. And that empowerment is in all the light that has been given to this movement. The problem is we don't understand it. If we understood the light uh, that God had given us, I believe that the event would have occurred as we expected. That is, I don't believe that we were ready for the mission that would have been given to us. Because if Nashville had occurred, we would have been put on the world stage. And I don't think that we could have lasted in that situation. I don't think we were ready for that. One is in our understanding of the message. Um, and 
and in the type of persecution that we would experience, I don't think we, we know what that is like. Uh, we haven't experienced it. Um, you know, we, we've, we've had a taste of it maybe to a little bit, a little bit of criticism, you know, but imagine the world turning against you. Uh, and, and first they, they like you, but then they turn against you. It's an, it'd be very, very difficult experience to go through. So we know that Ezekiel is a watchman. He goes through this period of seven days of consecration. That's how I interpret it. And then he's told that he's going to be made a watchman. And then he's given this message. And, and he knows that he has to go into his house and study. Right? He's going to be shut up. But when it says, but thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. Um, I'm not sure what that means, right? So I'm not sure is this something that's imposed upon us, or is it symbolic in some way? Uh, we know that Ezekiel does at points, he does go out among them. So in what way is this, this applying to us, and what way does it apply to him? And that I don't have the answer to. Um, if, you, no, we, if you go to scripture and find bands, it's uh, got to, there's a scripture in Revelation, I can't call it right now, beauty and bands. Yeah. And uh, I went, I took a deep dive into that. Mm -hmm. And I've got some symbolism in my own life about it. But uh, I think it's worth worth taking a look at. Uh, if you just search, search uh, beauty and bands. Yeah. Yeah, I'm familiar with it. I'm not sure how to apply it here. Um, it has to do with the message, but um, I could think about it and study it. Um, but anyway, they're going to have these bands, and they're going to be, and the, these people, whoever they are, the people that he gives the message to, I'm not sure. But they And shall bind thee with these bands, and thou shalt not go out among them. And then I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and shalt not be a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. So the only way that I can take this is this is referring to later on in his ministry. That this isn't talking about the beginning, at least as far as the, bound, the bond, bands are concerned. Now, I think when he shuts himself in his house, the way that I would take this is that he needs to study and it's a type of imposed uh, restriction upon himself until he hears a word from God. But I don't know how to apply this bands really, whether it's something future or something that's going to happen to him immediately, uh, or just something that is symbolic as the result of once he gives a message, um, the people aren't going to listen. And, and so symbolically, he's bound in that sense. Um, but, you know, that he's going to make the tongue cleave to the roof of his mouth, that God's going to do that to Ezekiel. Uh, we know that God is going to give us the words that we are to speak when people are willing to receive them. And I've experienced this personally. Um, I've said, you know, things that were just the right thing to say when God had a person that was willing to receive them. And sometimes I've been completely dumbfounded when talking to somebody who's not open to hear God's word. God didn't give me any insight or any words to them, even though I tried to speak to them. I've had, in a sense, my tongue cleaved to the roof of my mouth because that person was unreceptive. Um, and so this could be what this is referring to. But he says in verse 27, so this to me is the important part, but when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth and thou shalt say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, he that heareth, let him hear. He that forbeareth, let him forbear. And so we know that God does open our mouth. So we have a time when our mouth is closed. We have a time when our mouth is open. And, and God is going to give us this message. And the message we're going to give is you can hear if you're going to hear, or you can reject this if you're going to reject it. And that's because this is a rebellious house. So... Hopefully that helps sets the stage uh, chronologically and thematically for what we're going to see as we go through Ezekiel. Now, 
I know a lots of you are already familiar with Ezekiel chapter 4. And that's what we're going to start studying on Sunday. So we're going to have uh, continue on Sunday. We, obviously, we're not having a study uh, tomorrow morning or, or, or Sabbath. I do have a, a Friday night Bible study at uh, 7 p.m. So anybody's welcome to that if you can attend that. And um, I, I'm sometimes going to review some of these ideas in the Friday night study um, that happened during the week and also any, any new ideas. And, and I kind of know what I want to do uh, with some things on Friday night, but sometimes it changes. But anyway, Sunday morning, we're going to start on chapter four. And, and we know that this is going to be dealing with the siege of Jerusalem. So this is going to be the first thing. Um, and chapter three and chapter four are continuous narrative. Right from, uh, you know, chapter one, it's all on the same date. That's the position that I take. So this chapter, Ezekiel chapter four happens on the fifth day of the fourth month. And it's just continuous. So when it says that also son of man. So he says, I'm going to give you this message, whether they hear and whether they forbear. And the message, the first message that Ezekiel is to give is going to be Ezekiel chapter 4. And we're going to see why that's important. So all this other time, God is, has, has him in vision, and he's still in vision in chapter 4. But he's setting him up to give this message. And this is a message based on time. And um, so I think it, it definitely does apply. And I think how we've applied this, um, I would say, is is much more sound and we have much more basis for it after going for it through these first three chapters. Any thoughts on what we've studied so far? I got through this a little faster than I thought I would. Yeah, question, like Ezekiel okay. is a priest, a priest for 30, for 30 years. Yeah. Does that mean he's, he's a priest from his birth or that's just symbolic there or something? Yeah, so from your birth, to when you become 30 years of old, you're still a priest because you're born into a priest's house, but you're okay. not a dedicated priest until you're 30. So okay. when you're 30, you become a priest. Now, it doesn't say that Ezekiel is 30 years old, but he is a priest and he gives the symbol of 30 years, going back to the Passover of, um, of Josiah. So he goes from 622 to five. 592, that's 30 years, and he says it's the 30th year, and, and we did study that to see that it's actually 30 years of a jubilee cycle. Um, so whether he's actually 30 years old at that time or not, I don't know. I'm assuming that, that he is, but it doesn't really matter. It's as a symbol, 30 years symbolizes a priest, as does the fact he says he's a priest, and then also the seven days of consecration. So I would apply that to Ezekiel. I would assume that he is, though, 30 years old, that he was born at the time of Josiah's Passover in that year. Um, and, and, and maybe that's why he uses it as a jubilee cycle. Maybe it's just a jubilee cycle that's a personal jubilee cycle for him. I don't know. But he does apply it as a jubilee cycle in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 1. And then we have... Um, um, these, these other symbolisms that, that we have in our history, we know that 30 years is for us as priests, as a symbol. So we're, in a sense, this movement is born in 1989. And so we just thought about, well, November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019. What we neglected to see is that it's not just a single date. It's a period of 777 days. And that we're going to have this period of 777 days at the end. And again, these are symbols. Even though they exist literally within time, it's the symbolism that matters in regard to how we apply them. So those that think that at November 9th, that they became priests and were now consecrated, they didn't realize that they have this test, these three sevens, symbolizing the completeness and, and of being three, because it's repeated, it's 777, seven, seven. but also it's this period of consecration of seven days. And this is something preparing us to give a message about the Sunday law, about the true Sabbath. So there's lots of symbolism here um, that I don't think is, 
is imaginary. I think it's something that you know we've we've already established. I just think there's more of it, more to it than we had seen before. I and think then, right here at uh, Ezekiel three twenty six and going into chapter four, we're looking at a turning point in 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 the movement's history, and that we're going to experience uh, this symbolism, and uh, it's not in the distant future. It's it's in our immediate future. Yeah, so the tongue being cleaving to the roof, roof of our mouth and us being dumb. Um, well, I would think that it actually occurred on July 18th. That's my personal view um, of, of how I look at it. But I could be wrong. Maybe it does apply to the future. But I, I've seen that we thought we had a message. We gave that message a warning. And yet, you know, we, we have this... Um, now, you know, and Jeff would be doing it literally. He's not uh, giving any messages. Now we are, but we're studying. So we're shut up, shut up in our house, so to speak, and, um, and studying, trying to understand what the message is, what went wrong, uh, why, why were we, why did our prediction fail from the point of, of being an external event, and how do we understand uh, the time that we're in? So that's, that's where I would put that parallel, myself personally, but it could apply to the future within this movement as well. So um, we do have a few minutes, but uh, we can close with prayer if there's no more questions. Okay, so uh, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are uh, again thankful. Um, the experience that we have experienced has taught us a lot. Uh, we understand uh, the emotions of those in the Millerite history who experienced the disappointment, but also, Lord, more than that, uh, we've experienced uh, your hand upon us, guiding us and directing us. And we understand much more than we did before, even though we understand little. We just ask, Lord, that as we spend this time studying Ezekiel, uh, we have a couple of days off to do personal study, uh, to review uh, this topic and um, to explore it further uh, in, in our own time, especially the Sabbath uh, time that we have uh, we just ask, Lord, that when we come together to study again on Sunday morning, uh, that uh, you can guide us and, and keep us. Uh, we pray for the people in this movement and the people in Adventism. We know, Lord, that it's a difficult time in this world. Sometimes we want to escape from the reality of what's around us. And especially for us in this movement, even though we know what's happening and that you're in control, Sometimes it's a bit overwhelming, uh, the responsibility that you're giving us, because uh, we don't feel that we're ready uh, for any of this. Uh, so we just ask, Lord, that you can continue to help us to grow and to learn and to develop a faith um, that we can have this head of flint, uh, that we can stand against those who are opposed uh, to this message. Uh, that we can be faithful watchmen upon the walls of Zion and that we can give that warning. Um, so be with us throughout this day, Lord. Uh, be with each person and we pray and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh